Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us, friends and colleagues, and welcome to the Johnson Choyama Graduate School of Public Policy's featured lecture series on public consultation. This series explores the growing expectation that public opinion be woven into policy formation. My name is Amy Zarzechny, and I'm an assistant professor here with the Johnson Choyama Graduate School. It's my pleasure to be your moderator for this afternoon's event. As many of you know, we are one school with a campus both on the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan. So I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our friends and colleagues at the U of S, where the event will be moderated by our director, Professor Michael Atkinson. I would also like to welcome our colleagues at the University of Regina's main campus here in the boardroom, and that event will be moderated by Mr. Ben Orr. Today we are extremely pleased to welcome Mr. Peter McLeod, who is the co-founder of Mass LBP, an innovative firm based in Toronto, which works with visionary governments and corporations to deepen and improve public consultation and engagement. Since 2007, MAP has led some of Canada's most original and ambitious efforts to engage citizens in tackling tough policy options while pioneering the use of civic lotteries and citizen reference panels on behalf of a wide array of clients. As a former fellow for the Center, of, uh, at the, Center for the Study of Democracy at Queen's University, Mr. Peter McLeod writes and speaks frequently about the citizens' experience of the state, the importance of public imagination, and the future of responsible government. A graduate of the University of Toronto and Queen's University, Mr. McLeod was also the recipient of the Public Policy Forum's prestigious Emerging <coughs> Leaders Award in 2008. So we are simply thrilled to welcome Mr. Peter McLeod here today to speak with us about the promise of public engagement. Following the presentation, we'll entertain questions from all three locations, but for now, please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker. Gosh, Mr. Peter McLeod. You can, you can all just call me Pete, but it's uh, fine. It really is a pleasure to be here uh, at the, uh, the University of Regina, and I guess, I guess as well at the University of Saskatchewan. It's like a two-for-one deal this afternoon. Um, I trust everything is working electronically, and that if it isn't, someone will at some point wave or jump up and down, and we'll, we'll catch view of that and we'll fix it. Um, you know, five years ago, I, I started this funny shop, Mass LBP, and, and you very graciously left out the part about me quitting my doctorate um, in order to do so. And I, I very much straddle the kind of two worlds of academe and business so that when I get the opportunity to come to a university department, it actually, uh, it actually feels like a bit of a treat, you know, because it's, it's that world away from my current reality of squawking clients and deadlines and RFPs and all of the kind of sundry activities that go into trying to take social science uh, into the marketplace, which is effectively what we do. Um, I'm here this afternoon to, to talk about the promise of public engagement. And, um, well, how do you start these things, right? quite fashionably, you turn to, uh, to Google. Uh, and I, I was, uh, I, I can't even claim to have turned to it, I sent an intern to turn to it, which is one of the other great advantages of having a business. Um, and I said, plug in three very fashionable words into their little book graphinator thing, right? And what you can see is a, a plot line that runs from 1950 uh, right up until 2008, and the uh, blue line is sustainability, and quite noticeably around the 1980s, it starts to quickly gain traction, coming out of, not surprisingly, the Brundtland Commission's report. Uh, you see innovation, um, a fashionable enough business term, and one that we think is perhaps a panacea for just about any problem these days. <laughs> what do we need? More innovation, that'll fix it. Well, you know, if you had stock in innovation, you would be doing pretty well. Uh, but engagement, engagement um, actually overtakes innovation. And I, I, you know, whether you actually believe the numbers, I certainly see this anecdotally because increasingly in my work, I run into these newly minted creatures called directors of communications, which would have been a perfectly respectable title just five or six years ago. But now they're called directors of communications and community engagement. Well, what exactly does all of this mean? Um, our work is very much about trying to fulfill the promise of public engagement. And I think in order to do that, you need to start with some theory. So in my talk this afternoon, I'm going to spend about half of it 
going back to what I think are some essential democratic principles which form the building blocks for not only an approach to public engagement, but what I also modestly think is a kind of pedagogy of adult policy learning. And I'm going to then take you through some of the more recent examples at Mass and, and how we've tried to, to put theory into practice. And then, because this is, I guess, about public engagement and I can't just drone at you for 90 minutes, we'll have some time for questions and you can try and pick holes and pull all of this apart. All right? I suppose I should start, though, uh, with uh, an explanation. We are constantly asked just what kind of a name for a company is Mass LBP. Well, it's a bit high-minded, uh, but we actually derived our name from, from two things. One is this really stirring and evocative quote from the British American pamphleteer Thomas Paine, who said there's a mass of sense lying in a dormant state that good government should quietly harness. And I like that as a description for how it would be that government would go about trying to engage with the public. It's not an all-consuming activity. It's not about marching up and down Main Street. It's about this quiet, constant tapping of civic ability uh, and, and civic insight. And of course, obviously, Tom Paine wasn't thinking at all about um, British North America or, or Canada. He was, um, but he nevertheless included this, this very evocative Canadian phrase of good government. Right? So I like that. But it's also because, frankly, we spend most of our time working at the intersection between 21st century mass societies that have their own special characteristics and a lot of 18th and 19th century political institutions that struggle to keep up. And then just as a counterbalance for all that weightiness, LBP is just meant to mess with people and it stands for led by people. So um, we are, as I've described already, a, a private company. There are six of us. We have a little storefront on King and Parliament, maybe an auspicious intersection uh, in Toronto. If you happen to be in the city, I, I hope you'll come and visit us. Um, though a private company, we have a real sense of public mission. And that public mission uh, is about trying to reinvent public consultation. The reason that we would like to reinvent it is because, frankly, we think that a lot of it is useless. And it's a provocative way to start. But the good people at NBC produced this very brief clip that I'm about to play, and I hope reaches our colleagues uh, over the bridge here. Uh, which does as good a job as you could possibly imagine lampooning uh, the sort of business as usual that happens when well-meaning governments try and reach out to the public. And I suspect there are a few people in this audience who are probably fans of the television show Parks and Recreation. Well, I, I had a look at the list of the people who are in the room today, and I know that many of you are directors and managers in different government departments, and I suspect you have all, at some point in your careers, been inside that sweaty rec center uh, waiting for the public to arrive. And I guess the point is that all of us can kind of nod and kind of chuckle knowingly, uh, and, that, and that this wasn't produced just for a public policy crowd, but of course for a mainstream American audience and assume that everybody would get the joke of public consultation, then that's actually quite liberating because it makes it possible for the rest of us to, to take some of this satire seriously and to say, all right, maybe the status quo isn't good enough. Maybe we need to rethink some of this because, you know, extend the caricature here. I think too often when it comes to public consultation, something that we're told is an uncontested good and we should all do a whole lot more of, um, we actually end up wasting our time, we waste the public's time, and we just go through the motions. You know, there's an adage, of course, in a democracy, maybe it's the fundamental description that we are governed by the people. I don't think that it's so much that we are governed by the people, so much as we are governed by our assumptions about the people. And one of the most, perhaps, 
dangerous, or at least damaging aspects of this whole sad satire is the fact that many of our assumptions about this public, this phantom public that we all talk so very much about, is that our assumptions about it are reinforced by what are just some pretty poorly, shabbily designed public consultation events. So let me paint this caricature for you, because perhaps in a democracy there is no kind of greater paragon of, I don't know, civic involvement than the idea of a town hall meeting. If you want to be really democratic, right, you get the largest room you can in town, and you set up two microphones here and there, and you assemble a little table at the front, and regrettably, usually you've gotten your act together you know, only a, a, a couple of weeks or a couple of days before the actual event, so you send out the notices and you hope people come, and in fact, you're probably only doing this because you're already picking up on your antenna that people aren't very happy with something that's going on, right? So maybe you've been pressured into holding this meeting, and the people who turn out are those who already have a stake in the issue, they're upset, they want to vent, they want to uh, tell you what it is they think. So we have this idea that town halls equals democracies, but what I would most like to do sometime is maybe get a nurse or a GP to stand next to those two microphones, maybe with a, um, a heart rate monitor, or something for blood pressure, or maybe neural probes who could attach little stickers. Because the one thing that, that most people fear most in life, right, they'd be prepared to do all kinds of other things before they would be prepared to stand in a room full of strangers, right, and say their needs. Most people find that incredibly disquieting, right? And so their heart starts pumping, and their hormones start surging, and they're kind of just flooded with adrenaline. And no wonder that people, when they get to the microphone, uh, have so much difficulty expressing themselves, or that it becomes such an adversarial uh, dynamic. And I don't put the fault on, on the people standing at the microphone. I think it's actually a pretty cruel thing. We know enough about stress responses in humans to know that that's not actually a particularly nice way to go about it. People who have no trouble standing and telling others what they think are, are perhaps more pathological than they are healthy. Um, so this, this isn't a recipe for doing democracy as we might, might like it. It may have worked when we lived in smaller towns and, and cities, right? But when we are fundamentally strangers to one another, we perceive everything in that environment probably as a threat. So town halls today, they don't equal democracies. They're more likely to cause aneurysms. We have this idea, though, that um, maybe we can do it better online. Right? This is the great promise uh, and from my earliest days at the University of Toronto, where we tried um, some very early instances of, of civic deliberation on pan-American issues, I can say that even though the graphics have gotten better, the, the fundamental technology hasn't improved so much. You know, when you, oftentimes, uh, people say it would be good if we could do it online because uh, it'll be cheaper. Right? You want to go to the trouble of renting the rec center and putting out the cookies or whatever it might be. And, and certainly uh, you can get more people, right? Because there's no capacity constraint. Um, and it will also be more convenient. That's an that's a explanation I often hear. And, and sometimes, almost inevitably, someone will play it out and say, in fact, doing this all online will be so convenient that you know someone can do it um, with their laptop wearing their pajamas in bed at night. Because that's the essence of democracy, right? It's an activity that's supposed to happen in utter isolation from one another through a keyboard at a moment of utter convenience at the end of a, a long and towering day. Some of this just doesn't add up to me. Um, certainly, I think one of the, the sort of most essential aspects of democracy is, is the ability that we, we have to look one another in the eye and to try and acquire a sympathetic relationship one another, and, and the degree to which that's mediated by so many online platforms, I don't think really gets us there. So um, that to say nothing of all of the concerns around anonymity and how that 
really lets people off the, the leash to say virtually anything they please. So it's not so much that the, the web offers us an easy way out or a way to do it that much better. In fact, it ends up looking much like the comment section of the, the Globe and Mail or maybe the leader post here. Um, as I said, I think one of the uh, most challenging aspects of this kind of conventional, and obviously I'm making a caricature here, one of the most uh, troubling aspects of all of this is that it does reinforce a set of assumptions about the public. And, and I think these assumptions could be characterized as the following, that we tend to view the public as a force in our society that is highly polarized. 50% of people want one thing, 50% of people want the other, then it flips overnight, right? You start trying to manage the margins, so it's polarized, it's volatile, um, it's highly emotional, and it's ill-informed. And if you're a public servant, uh, this immediately sets off some alarm bells. And I think it leads you perhaps to then try and, and do what is a, a, an essential uh, professional, to exercise an essential professional competency. Um, it's to risk manage, right? And it's to then perceive that those members of the public as a risk that need to be managed. And how do you manage the public? Well, you manage it by saying, well, we're only going to have two meetings, not four. We're only going to do it in this part of town, not another. We're only going to ask the following questions, not the real question. There's only going to be this much time in which we're actually going to have the conversation, and we're only going to take summary notes, not detailed notes, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We'll engage stakeholders. Right? Um, and this is a, a defensive reaction, and I see a few heads nodding in the room, so I hope this kind of proves to some degree uh, my, my hypothesis that we have come lamentably to view this public as a risk and then we employ all of these different mechanisms and strategies to contain that risk. Now, I don't think any of you probably um, would come to a lecture at a school of public policy, much less make careers out of public policy, uh, if you didn't also believe that the public um, was something fundamentally different than this fairly uh, cynical uh, perspective that I've laid out. And this might sound a little care bears in kindergarten, uh, but I happen to believe, that, and certainly through all of my experience working with the public in a different way, um, that the public is capable of much more. I view the public, and, and let's just pause for a second to say the whole term the public, I just, I wish I could punt, right, and just get rid of, because I don't know what I'm talking about when I say the public so often. I can't take the largest room here in Regina and say, okay, bring in the public. Like, how do we know when they're there? It's not Noah's Ark. You can't count it two by two and say, there, we've got the public. In fact, I think it makes a much better adjective than it does a noun, right? Like, I know when people are thinking in a public-minded or public-spirited way, right? Even if they're an ostensibly representative group, they may not in any respects be thinking in a public-minded way. They're, they could well be thinking, perhaps legitimately, in a very self-interested way. So that the language doesn't help us too much here. And even though I'm going to continue in my presentation to refer to the public, I want to put a heavy asterisk around it, that it is quite problematic. And if we could think about it as an adjective, I think it would be a whole lot better than being stuck with it as a noun. Nevertheless, um, I'd like to think that this phantom public is capable of a whole lot more. I think that the public actually um, cares about more than its own interests. I think people are certainly capable of exercising reason. Um, I think that people want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Right? I think they have a they are motivated to serve. That would be another way to describe it. And I think that people are fundamentally curious. In fact, a whole lot more so than we frankly give them credit for. And all of this plays against a whole bunch of trends that originally got me into academia, which was you know, the decline of trust and confidence in public institutions, and declining voter turnout and all the rest. In any event, um, if you think of the public in this way, even if it's as a matter of a leap of faith rather than the other way, then you start to regard them really as a resource that can be tapped rather than a risk. And, and everything that I'm saying and, and all of our work at Mass is really no more complicated than this. It is just trying to move from a kind of dominant view of the public as a risk to be managed towards a resource to be tapped and to try and come up with some better mechanisms to do that. And it probably doesn't need 
know, further explanation, but why would we want to work with the public as a resource? Well, probably for three reasons. The first, that it's a source of legitimacy, right? I think we can work with the public to create mandates in the space between elections. I think that um, done well, it actually pays a kind of trust dividend that we can use public engagement to build back trust and confidence in institutions. And I think that's the end of the day. Hopefully, we're not just doing this because it's nice to do. We're doing it because we're going to be making some better decisions as a consequence. Okay. So I want to be clear that um, in all of this, I'm not trying to advocate for kind of crude populism. But, well, let's just do it better and put the people in charge. All of this is, is basically about saying that we want to rebalance the different interests. Because if you are a, a minister or a deputy minister... Uh, you have all kinds of sources of, of input and expertise. We live in an open society where determined individuals can make themselves heard, right? And we certainly know that organizations, individuals, businesses can come together, create associations, lobbies, and can present their views to government as well. But outside of what is still pretty crude polling, surveying, work, actually discerning what is in the broader long-term public interest, that I think is a, is a, is a harder thing. We need some help. Um, I'm going to play for you another very quick clip to illustrate a little bit of what I'm talking about. Um, this is uh, Barry Schwartz, uh, who is the author of The uh, Paradox of Choice. Now, you might be sitting there saying, well, that's all well and good. That's Switzerland, and they're a little different over there anyway, right? Uh, except that psychologists and political scientists have tried variations on the study in other jurisdictions and other kinds of issues, and the results are fairly consistent. When matters of public policy are framed as matters of public interest rather than as uh, uh, matters of self-interest, support for that agenda increases. Um, and just to point to some, like a very minor, probably pedantic concern, I often walk into um, you know, my client's offices, and if they're in a hospital, say, uh, you'll find all kinds of posters around, and they'll be really excited about how they are doing, uh, you know, trying to do a really good job engaging their communities. And you'll find signs that say things like, your hospital, come have your say, come tell us what you think, your concerns matter. And it is this kind of covert consumerist language, right? It's like I consultation, not we consultation. And I think even in the choice of language, we're inadvertently skewing the conversation towards people thinking about what's in it for me. You know, all of this kind of junk political rhetoric about you know, your government, right? I mean, any, any first-year student in political science can tell you what you know, false and erroneous and misleading that is. You know, what's exciting about democratic societies is the fact that it's ours, it's a collective enterprise. But this is snuck in, and it, 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 it sours, it, it erodes what we ought to be trying to do when we bring people together to have conversations of public concern. Anyway, we appeal to people's sense of self-interest. We forget to appeal to their sense of public interest. Now, when it comes to developing a public engagement program, you know, we we look for four different things, and and the first one may seem really self-evident. The first is that the recommendations that come out of some kind of interaction with the public should be useful, right? Um, like I said, it should be self-evident, but how many times have you gone through the exercise only to come up with this kind of list of blue sky ideas that bear very little correspondence on the political reality, the fiscal reality, the amount of time in which someone can act, right? And this is kind of the hazards of, of public brainstorming. Uh, public expectations uh, become completely unmatched with what's politically possible. So to reach a set of useful recommendations is actually a design choice that has to be made up front and planned. The second is that it should enhance institutional trust and transparency. And again, how many times do people walk away from some process feeling like, the 
decisions already been made, they weren't really listening, they didn't ask the right questions. So again, something that's intended to do a good deal of, of good actually ends up leaving people feeling more cynical uh, and frustrated. Um, the third is a kind of a, a mass, a massism, I guess, that we, we coined. Uh, lots of people who talk about the importance of civic literacy, that if only more people knew who the first Prime Minister of Canada was, or the current Prime Minister of Canada, then we would we would probably live in a more democratically engaged uh, society, and that would be great. Democratic fitness is our counterpoint to that. We think of it as sort of the, the Aaron Brockovich school of politics, and um, even if you don't know the full Aaron Brockovich story, but maybe you saw the movie with Julia Roberts, um, you understand that Julia didn't know who her senator was or how a bill became law. What she had was a sense of real moral courage. She had a sense of voice, of personal efficacy. And that's what we're trying to cultivate uh, through our work, that as a, as a result, when people have the opportunity to, to be, become a part of this, um, that they, uh, they then walk away feeling as though their voice matters and, and that they can affect outcome. Uh, the last, and again, I know this seems very self-evident, but even though I, I run this practice that's about public engagement, I spend probably 70 or 80 percent of my time not working with the public, but actually working with my clients internally so that they're ready and prepared to be open interlocutors with the public and are then able to take the input and make it fit to whatever processes or decisions they need to make. And that is all about a kind of cultural shift internally as a prelude to doing any external work. We also have four uh, questions that we ask when we begin a project. We, we like to ask who's in the room and how did they get there? You know, I, I won't, I can guarantee you that I won't walk by your courthouse today and find a sandwich board out front that says, Murder trial this afternoon, jurors wanted. <laughs> For really good reason. We all know that that would be crazy, right? And yet every time we try and close a school or move services within a hospital or open up some new uh, uh, part of the resource sector, that's effectively what we do. We put out the sandwich board and we say, those people who got a real beef with what we're about to do come on down, right? Um, it's important. People with a pronounced interest in an issue should have access, right? But let's not pretend that that's a suitable proxy for the general public. The second is, are we asking people for their opinion or to represent the views of others? This is a really critical point. Um, Again, as I've, as I've said, it's not all about speaking from a personal perspective. I think that you know, the, real, the real challenge in a democracy is how we try and put ourselves in one another's shoes to try and understand one another's needs as well as we understand our own. And one of the first things that I say when I invite a typical panel of 36 people who've traveled from across a province are committed to spending four or five Saturdays of their time with us um, and, and have been selected at random uh, from, say, a thousand people, I say, um, you know, I'm really impressed that you're taking the time to be a part of this process. And, and I honor that you are taking that time from your families and rest and from work and the rest of it. But I don't actually care what you think. Everybody in that room goes, what do you mean? That's why I'm here. Your experience really matters. I hope you will bring the wealth of your experience to the process. But you got to put yourself in other people's shoes if this is going to work. And everyone goes, ooh. And you know what's interesting But when you challenge, because what we're talking about is representation. When you challenge people to step into others' shoes, you are in fact privileging them with that opportunity to speak for others. And and so, so almost imperceptibly, I can see from the front of the room, people sit up a little bit straighter in their chairs, right? Because now this is really serious. This isn't just about them. It's fascinating to watch. The third is that, is there a real task? 
You know, at the end of the day, I've learned that Canadians are hard-headed Northerners. We, we don't like talk for the sake of talk. We like to get stuff done. So if you ask people to help come solve a problem, come answer a question, then people are only too happy to muck in. It taps into our kind of barn raising ethic. But if you're just going to have a meandering conversation about preferences and general priorities and what you might like, and it's not at all clear how any of this is going to influence any action, then of course people have a very good sense of the value of their own time. They'll make their decisions accordingly. The last bit is what learning needs to occur. You know, I, I think we, uh, in a way, patronize the public here um, because, you know, this is this idea that, well, you know, all opinions are equal and valid and we want to hear all voices and perspectives. <sighs> right? You know, I have opinions, um, as you may well gather, about all kinds of things. Um, and it might be interesting at a dinner party, but it is not a sound basis for policy making, right? Uh, and those people in government know a tremendous amount, not everything, that's for sure. But they, they have real expertise, and I think we need to become much more skillful as adult educators, proper term being co-learners, with the public in sharing what we know to inform a conversation so that we can also better understand what it is they know. Right? So there needs to be a curriculum behind all of this stuff too. It's not just enough to say, you know, here's what's going on, now tell us what you think. All right, so um, that is all the kind of theory behind um, the approach that we've landed on. And, and I won't uh, presume to think that it is, uh, you know, we've cracked the nut. It's just the best we've been able to do. You know, it comes out of the work, actually, of both the um, BC and the Ontario Citizens Assemblies uh, on electoral reform that took place seven and eight years ago. Um, I had the opportunity to work with the Secretariat of the Ontario Citizens Assembly. You know, one of the most remarkable numbers, I think, in, in Canadian democracy of the past decade is the fact that in both BC and Ontario, the government set out 100,000 letters asking people if they would be willing to spend 16 weekends traveling from every riding in the province the course of nine months to study something as completely off the radar and of obscure as electoral reform. We're not talking about the environment or jobs or healthcare, stuff people actually care about, um, as we discovered, uh, but electoral reform. And of the 7,000 people who received the letter from their government, of the 100,000 people who received the letter from their government, 7,000 people volunteered. All walks of life. And this in a society where we say, oh, people can't be bothered to come out to a town hall meeting. Points that there's something else perhaps going on. Well, we, we, we tried to adopt that because you know, those assemblies cost millions of dollars. And we thought, wouldn't it be interesting if you could lop off a whole lot of zeros from that and use a similar approach to deal with the kind of more pedestrian and routine kind of public policy issues that come along. So we, we call it a civic lottery and a citizen's reference panel. We call it a civic lottery because we want people to feel good about winning. And it's a very funny thing uh, at our office when we get on the phone four or five times a year and we call the 36 panelists and we say, congratulations, you've won four Saturdays to spend at a hospital talking about cancer care. And people actually react as though they've won the Lotto 649. I mean. It's crazy. Honey, honey, you wouldn't believe. I, I you know, someone said, I've, I've never had anything to do with government. Do you think there'll be any interest in there? What, what, what do I need to do to prepare? And it's not just all the keeners who are turning out. You know, ask, you know, inevitably there's some guy named, I don't know, Bob. And you say to his, Bob, what, what motivated you to volunteer for this? He said, well, all I ever do is bitch and moan. And so my wife, when she got a hold of the letter, I think she filled it out. <laughs> and that's okay, right? Because that's actually part of the general public, too. Anyway, um, let me say a little bit more about the civic lottery. It's a random representative selection process. We typically send out five or 10,000 letters to randomly selected households. This is one that went out uh, just a few months ago on behalf of the Ontario Ministry of Consumer Services. We were looking for 36 people to spend four Saturdays with us advising the government on um, its uh, new condominium act, right? 
So clearly a policy topic of immediate pronounced public concern. Um, we have a, a 4 to 7 percent response rate, which if you know anything about direct mail and, and considering what we're asking is incredibly high. Um, you know, people would think, oh, couldn't you do this on Twitter or something? Why do you need to write so much and have so much paper? Well, it's important because people will take it and they'll show it to their spouse or they'll bring it into work and they'll say, you know, Wendy, what do you think about this? Sincere, should I? Right? They need to think about it. So we give them six weeks before they have to reply from the time that they receive it. We've learned that actually sending it on brown envelopes. Give us a, gives us about a 1.5% bump on the response rates than if we send in white envelopes. Any guesses why? Right. Taxes, right? It looks like a tax reform. I take a tremendous liberty with my clients' uh, logos, right? We just slap the Ontario or the Alberta or the BC anywhere we can. It's great. Uh, they fill out a response card. Um, we select for only three criteria. And this, is, this always strikes people as a bit surprising. Age, gender, and geography. So it's half men, half women, which right there is a good deal better than the Saskatchewan legislature. And um, it's age cohorts, typically four or five of them. And then we'll break it out in some sort of geographic distribution. So it might be wards or it might be regions or, or what have you. We don't select for income, ethnicity, or education. Not because they're not important, uh, but because we've learned we don't have to. We've run about 20 of these now, mailing more than 100,000 Canadians. And then we've got the two samples of the two assemblies to compare with. It, it is, I think it says something quite positive about the vibrancy of our society, that whether rich or poor, whether an established Canadian or new Canadian, um, there is a similar degree of interest. And the right demographic mix, I swear to you, comes out in the mix each and every time we pull the sample. Right? Um, and all of this is towards creating, this is a group for Toronto Community Housing, uh, a citizen's reference panel. Now we call it a reference panel because uh, it's not, again, about putting people in charge. It's about merely referring an issue to them who refer back to the decision makers um, a series of recommendations. And those decision makers might be the board of a hospital, they might be uh, a manager within a government department, or it might be a, a minister or a mayor. Um, there are five stages to it. I've talked about the civic lottery, which is how we get the people in the room. We then develop a, a curriculum, and often we have an arm's length advisory group of kind of blue ribbon academics or others who vet the curriculum, because obviously the easiest way to challenge the integrity of the process would be to say you're teaching to the test, you're, you're teaching to an answer you want to hear. So we have to be very careful about that. Um, we bring in public policy experts, we bring in um, people from the community, frontline staff, uh, those who can present the range of kind of re reasonable perspectives on a given issue. People will say, well, this is all well and good for the 36, but what about the broader community? So typically we will organize a, a a survey might go out with the letter, it might be online. We'll hold what we call a public roundtable meeting where any person can come. Uh, what's interesting about these meetings is that as facilitators, we step away. Each roundtable is actually hosted by members of the citizens' reference panel. So now it's citizens talking to citizens, and it totally changes the dynamic in the room, as you might expect. And each roundtable would have a different theme because people who come to public meetings have something typically that they want to talk about. Um, we then have a deliberation phase. People have to make tough choices at the end of this. Um, and in fact, by having to make tough choices, they invest even more seriously in the process. Right? They then have to come up with not perfect consensus, but a broad degree of shared agreement. Um, concerning the recommendations they make. And those panelists who very rarely feel somewhat out of step with one or more of the recommendations can include what we call a minority report at the back. It's typically a paragraph or two explaining their thinking. Now, I'll, I'll show you just some pictures. This was um, in Halton region. They had a very divided regional council. Uh, and so the, chief, this, uh, the CAO, chief administrative officer, Two days after the election, it was a very bold thing, sent 10,000 letters to households throughout Halton asking people that they would spend four Saturdays with us to identify a set of priorities for the next term of council. And 
uh, they went through this process. Here's someone you know, working on a waste management idea. It has to be iterative. You have to go through this again and again. First ideas are just rough drafts, right? Just like writing a paper. Uh, here's a, a public roundtable meeting. They've got some materials, uh, previous discussion to help keep them on track. Um, making the tough choices towards the end. That's, there's a gentleman who's quite pleased with an idea he's got about tourism promotion. At the very end of the process, this is uh, Gary Carr, who's the regional chair for this to the uh, left, I guess. That side, the old guy. Um, he was the, uh, the speaker of the Ontario legislature beforehand under the Harris government. Uh, he's a huge proponent of, of this stuff now. And um, at the very end, we, we hand out certificates of public service. Um, and, you know, sometimes we think that maybe we're being just a little too cute, a little too up with citizens, right? Uh, and that maybe this isn't necessary. But we got this idea actually from the Ontario Citizens Assembly when my former academic supervisor, Jonathan Rose, their academic director, uh, decided that because the citizens in that 16-week process had spent, I think, six of them in an intensive learning process, they had basically completed a kind of graduate degree in electoral mechanics by that point. And because it was a group of 103 citizens um, representing the province, you know, you had many of them who uh, had not completed high school or had only a high school degree. They hadn't gone on to college or university. And he recognized intuitively that this was a major accomplishment for a lot of people. Because in your day-to-day -day jobs, frankly, perhaps with the exception of uh, institutions like this, not a whole lot of serious learning goes on where you have to ma master a new topic. So he decided and argued for the time to hand out certificates. And one woman came up to him afterwards um, and she said, uh, Jonathan, I, I, I never finished high school. Uh, my husband never finished high school. And I didn't really know what to make, whether I'd be able to do this when I, when I received the invitation. And I'm so glad I did. You know, just this past month, we got to go and see our daughter graduate from high school. And I can't tell you what it means to be able to take this certificate home to my daughter after this weekend and show her that her mom graduated too. And you just kind of melt, right? As if there was some deputy minister of democratic renewal when this process was <laughs> being planned, thinking that he or she could have that kind of direct and personal impact on someone as a result of commissioning this project. That's what I mean when I talk about democratic fitness. That's what I mean about expanding someone's sense of worth and their sense of their ability to contribute to their community. So we do it now too, and every two or three months I get a phone call from one of the 600 panelists that we've had saying, uh, Pete, I, uh, I uh, dropped my certificate and it, it broke or it got lost in the move. And we think, hey, you, me, I mean, come on, it came off my laser printer at 11 o'clock the night before. How valuable is it? It's really valuable. It matters. And so we send them another one dutifully in the mail. So hanging on wood paneled rec rooms, um, you know, in, in three provinces now, hopefully you'll come across some of these certificates. Um, all of this, I, I, I want to remind you, should remind us, that government isn't only a technical institution. It's a social institution as well. One of the questions we often get is, well, what do your clients do with the recommendations they receive? And, and we've learned some things over the last five years, many things. We've created what we call a dual contract. One is what we do and what we get paid. We disclose our salaries online. Everybody at Mass makes the same. It's that exciting. Um, we have a, a secondary contract, though, that uh, requires the client to uh, very publicly acknowledge that this process is taking place, to respond to the recommendations in some detail, and with the goodwill to act on it. It doesn't commit them to act on everything. But one of the happiest days this past year is when the Ottawa Hospital, uh, which had commissioned us to do a big project on cancer care, sent back as only good public servants can do, sort of 90 recommendations about improvement to all facets of their cancer program. A year later, the recommendation from the citizens and then one of those perfect public sector color-coded uh, green, yellow, red, right? Little 
they, they did all of that, and then they had an explanation as to why it had happened, that it was pending, or why it couldn't happen. And they didn't just send it to the 48 members of that panel. They sent it to the 500 people who had applied to be a part of it. And to me, that's huge accountability. Because right? they felt that they had a mandate to make these changes, and they were accountable for what they did with the advice they received. All of this is, is thinking about a reference panel very much as a generic. It is simply one piece of the kind of larger like uh, toolkit engagement. But it's valuable because you've got a group of people who can take a deep dive into a specific issue that can really deliberate, can resolve differences, and present a, a fairly a concerted view of the result. So I've mentioned the Ottawa Hospital. You also did a, a very... Um, high-profile project in the last couple of years at Northumberland Hills Hospital. They had to balance a budget. We sent out 5,000 letters in October asking people to give us five Saturdays before Christmas. One in 12 households got the letter, one of our best ever response rates. And it's, they made some tough choices. They decided to close their palliative care clinic in order to maintain their maternity services. That's not a choice that I think communities should have to make. Uh, but they were between a rock and a hard place where the government had given them money to build a much larger hospital than the operating funds could afford. And within six years, they found themselves in a pretty grueling deficit. And when that happens in Ontario, typically the ministry sends in someone to make the decision that the board can't. So they were happier to own the decision as a community. And what didn't happen is perhaps as important as what did. No one went on strike. No one picketed the hospitals. Volunteers didn't flee the building. Donations didn't dry up. They increased because people felt that they had a real hand and they really understood why the choice was being made. Um, the condominium project, this is an interesting one because um, the group that just provided their advice to government is actually being brought back next September to then review the draft legislation, which is, first of all, it's the first time we've included a CRP in a legislative review process. But the idea that they bring them back a year later to kind of compare and contrast the advice they provided and, and the result is, is, to me, a real uh, commitment to accountability. We just did some work uh, in Calgary for, um, for their mayor uh, and uh, the Calgary Arts Development Authority in working with a group of citizens to advise them on their arts policy. Um, I'm going to conclude by talking about this uh, one final project, which... Uh, wasn't commissioned by a government. It was intended to be. Um, you'll remember two years ago that Toronto hosted the G8 G20, uh, and the Premier had organized a meeting uh, where he asked a bunch of academics and myself to come sit with him, talk about how you could have an adult conversation about healthcare. Now, this is a, a fashionable thing that political leaders in this country want to do from time to time. Uh, the difficulty is that the meeting had been scheduled months before, and the actual meeting took place the day after some protesters lit one of the police cars on fire in downtown Toronto, which I can tell you is an acutely bad time to try and convince a premier of the merits of public engagement. Um, by that time as well, he realized that he would be going into an election in the not-so-distant future, and maybe he didn't really want to open this can of worms, but it would still be really helpful if you could find a way to do it um, just in a way that government wasn't directly involved. PricewaterhouseCoopers, which had done a different kind of citizen process for the Cameron government, uh, stepped up and said, no strings attached, we'll fund this, this is a way for us to look innovative. Um, you love it, believe me, when things like this happen. Um, we sent out 10,000 letters, had 28 citizens, we spent three full weekends together. They came in Friday afternoon. We worked until Friday at uh, 9 o'clock in the evening. We had an absolute blue ribbon panel. These, these individuals practically finished a, a graduate degree in health policy at rocket speed. Um, they uh, would work from Saturday at 8 until Saturday at 9 and then start and Sunday from 8 until Sunday at 4, and then all fly back and, and take trains, planes, to, uh, to return to their homes. And their job was to try and provide some instruction as to how we could ensure the sustainability of the health system. And uh, this is what it, it looked like, media at St. Mike's Hospital. There I am in my kind of Donkey Kong pose. Um, 
three weekends, 20 speakers, 400 slides, a bit like this afternoon, and uh, 48 recommendations and all kinds of very meaty issues. I wouldn't presume for it to be comprehensive. I only wish that I'd had, I don't know, three weekends to focus on any one of these topics. Um, <laughs> But in the end, we sent this with some trepidation to Andre Picard, who's the health reporter for the Globe and Mail. And we're delighted when he came back with this headline um, 48 hours later. Finally, a healthcare paper that makes sense. It says, if you gave, quote, ordinary Canadians the opportunity to have a thoughtful, informed discussion about the state of healthcare and ask them to, for recommendations on how to sustain and improve the system, what would they come up with? Um, he says, the result is a fascinating and eminently sensible 45 page paper, which actually the citizens wrote, more on that later, um, entitled Public Priorities for the Health System. In any event, um, for me, the, the question is less and less about what the public wants. I think it's a very 20th century question. I think increasingly the question is, what is the public for? That is, you know, besides paying your taxes and, I don't know, not speeding on the Trans-Canada or you know, leading a generally morally upright life. What is it that we have for people to do? Because okay? government seems to run basically on, on a kind of autopilot with these quadrennial elections seemingly being enough. So what is the public for? Um, final word on communications, because I took a jab at directors of communications before, and there is this sort of spectrum um, that gets employed to talk about public engagement, that it goes from communications to empowerment. And I think that's a helpful way of organizing it, but I, I really want to make a firm distinction. It's, it's not the same thing as, as comms. It's not even a kind of uh, communications plus. Part of the reason is because we measure communications typically through impressions, through eyeballs, through hits, right? How many people were a part of it? And I don't think that's an adequate measurement for what I've been trying to describe in our approach uh, to public engagement. To me, uh, engagement is much more like governance, right? How do we measure governance? Well, good luck to you on that one. But I know that it has something to do with impact and it has to do with efficacy. Those are probably the appropriate measures with which to, to understand our work as well. Um, I also want to, to reinforce the idea that in, in my mind, public engagement and public learning are really flip sides of the same coin. And what I hope they add up to is actually a vision of public leadership. So I want to leave you then with kind of just three mass aphorisms, things that kind of sum up our worldview. The first is about elections. Elections used to be the things that gave you mandates. I think now they give you office. And the privilege of office is having a platform from which to create mandates. That would require a new vision of public leadership. The second is that people want a say. People always are clamoring for a say but they're also willing to serve. And it's an important distinction. Finally, uh, and not surprisingly, the problem with public engagement has never been that we've been asking too much of people. I think it's that we've been asking far too little. I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>